This is the Diverse Leaders Conversation Podcast. The only podcast for diverse leaders and founders. With your hosts, Dawn Morton Young and Kat Wildman. The Diverse Leaders Conversation Podcast. Starting up and rising up against the odds. Okay, hello and welcome to another edition of the Diverse Leaders Conversation podcast with me, Dawn Wharton Young, and my lovely co host, Kat Wildman. Hi. (laughs) And today we have the amazing, and I say amazing because I kind of know her, I know her, um, Sharon Green, who um, I met when I was working in HR as a HR interim because she uh, founded and and holds the space for all of us HR consultants and HR interims that are looking for um, networking and community and support because as a HR person, uh, it is quite isolating even when you're in an organisation, particularly if you're in a standalone role or you don't have a big HR team but when you're an interim you can feel like you're very much removed from what's going on what's happening in HR what's happening in employment law and um Sharon is the master that holds all of the strings together for all of us so that we can keep on top of things. And she provides a load of support to everyone when people are looking for roles, etc. So I'm really excited to have Sharon here. Um, and I will let her introduce what else she does as well as the interim group and maybe a bit of a background of how that started. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Kat. Thanks for having me, Dawn. I appreciate being here. So uh, let, tell me, what do you? What is it that you would say that you do? What would? What? What is your role? And um, why did you start the HR interims group? Ah, oh goodness me! Now I have to remember to focus and answer both of those questions because I might go off at a tangent. So, um, um, when people ask me what I do, um, I say I'm a professional interim. That's what I've done for the last sixteen years. Um, Before that, I had a permanent career. So I did work in permanent roles um, across different sectors. My last permanent role was in an international law firm, heading up their graduate recruitment and what you would call talent, I guess, talent acquisition and development and learning and development for an international law firm. So I was responsible for all of their trainees and where they went and also for their strategy of how we developed our people from the time that they joined to the time that they were senior leaders. Um, And then I decided to set up my own business. Um, And so when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a professional interim and I specialise in people change, tech and comms. So changing things often with technology um, or in a tech setup. um, But the communication, engagement, buy-in, how we involve our people in the people experience is really important to me. So that's what I kind of do for my day job. My side hustle is um, the um, HR Interim Networking Group, um, which I didn't actually set up myself. It started as a pub group for this wonderful lady called Helen, um, who set it up for her buddies and they used to meet in a pub and it was really small and I got to get involved and then Helen retired and we decided to take it on to LinkedIn and it's grown from a little support pub group to um, I think we've got about 1800 members globally um, and it's for interims consultants freelancers contractors coaches whoever works independently um, and in the people space, um, we offer a supportive space, like you said, Dawn. We're connecting people. Like I'm connecting to you guys. You know, um, we're sharing information. We network together in real life and virtually, and we share leads. Um, so it just kind of helps us have a tribe, I guess, and keep connected and not feel so isolated, which you can do when you're working on your own, like you said, right at the top dawn so yeah so that's my passion project my side hustle um and yeah that's what i do 
Thanks, Sharon. So let me ask you a question that we do ask most of our guests right at the beginning. And I know I didn't pre-warn you that I was going to ask you th this question, but how <laughs> would you identify? So I identify as a black British Caribbean woman. <laughs> how would you identify yourself? Um, how would I identify myself? Um, well, I guess I'd say that I'm a, I'm a, white British woman, I guess. Um, I've got some interesting, I guess, background, um, you know, a bit of a, a bit of diversity in my background um, from, you know, parents, grandparents, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's what I would kind of predominantly um, yeah. class myself as. Well, and I don't introduce uh, class there. Um, and I don't introduce class there because I think my dad would probably roll in his grave if I said I was working class <laughs> because he thinks he never used to like like us to say that for some reason. Um, but I'd probably say that I come from kind of working class roots really um, as well. Yeah. And, and we know that, you know, as much as we talk about the protected characteristics, um, that socioeconomic background is also a key element of outcomes for people um and so you know that to me comes in the same category of being underrepresented when you've come from a background where maybe the outcomes of the people in your area where you live or you know that type of thing are not within what they would have as the national average or the national standard mm -hmm. um and obviously you're you're a woman um so uh, I guess my first question is, and I know Kat will have a load, um, <laughs> but my first question is, how do you think that your journey has perhaps uh, differed or how has it been impacted, do you think, by um, being a woman uh, in, in a space? And I know you spoke about working for an international law firm. So in a space that's quite male dominated. So just mm. give us a, a bit of a... a you know, a background on how you think that has shaped your journey and any kind of examples or stories of things that could have happened whilst you've been making your way to where you are now, where you're kind of on your own two feet and, you know, mm. calling the shots. <laughs> oh, wow. That's such a big question, isn't it? I kind of, um, I think, I think I'd probably start back at, the, you know, like when I think about when I first entered the workplace, um, I think I really downplayed um, my gender. Um, I kind of, yeah, I, I kind of don't think I acknowledged some of the um, doors that maybe I had to push against to get to where, like just basically get to my first starting role. Um, because I because I I acknowledged that I was quite privileged on on some level, you know I I you know I was the first person in my family to get a degree, to, so to go on to higher education. My parents had never done that. Um, nobody in my family had done that. Um, you know, if I think to my mum and dad's siblings and um, and my mum and dad and 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 you know cousins or whatever I just didn't know anybody you know um and so I think that I hadn't really acknowledged that 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 was quite a big deal and that I, I through a series of circumstances I was quite lucky to be in that position and also I just didn't thought oh you know like I'm a feminist <laughs> you know I'm I'm a woman you know I'm not any different things aren't any different I felt like I downplayed that quite a lot and then in my first job I had um, my first experience of like working life, and um, and it wasn't necessarily ter terribly positive. Um, and I didn't, and I think part of the reason why I end, you know, it's kind of weird that I ended up in HR because I didn't really know what HR was, and um, and I guess probably when I needed it, um, I I didn't know how to access it. So I was, so I basically had, I was harassed at work in my, on my first job. I had no idea what that, um, I didn't even really know it was happening or what it looked like. 
Um, and so it's a bit of a rude awakening into the workplace and a very obvious reason, you know, I'm not saying that men don't get harassed either, um, but obviously more women get sexually harassed at work than men. And um, and so that was a bit of an eye-opener, really. But it did give me an education. <laughs> and, and so I did recognise being a woman at work was, was different to being a man. And then if you fast forward to being in a corporate environment, so when I, I started off my career in the NHS and then I moved to not for profit and then I ended up in a corporate environment which I thought I kind of had arrived you know I'm like I'm working in the city in London wow <laughs> you know like um who'd have thought it don't we all um, <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of a bit like who'd have thought it you know someone like me you know being working for an international law firm um and um and it was uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very male-dominated environment. The way that they view support departments, as they call them, is very different and othered, I guess. Um, I found it quite tough, particularly if you're wanting to um, to make change, which is what what I'm what I do. People change. Um, quite a traditional um, environment. And therefore, you know, it was a tough gig, you know. And after I worked for two international law firms, actually, before I, I set up on my own. And the part of the reason why I set up on my own was I didn't want to work for a third. I was just like, no, um, I don't want to work for a third firm. Yeah, I've and, worked, and I'm sorry to, um, to cut you there. I've worked within law before, and I think if you are not a fee Mm. they're not bothered. So mm. it's like they have the professional services in-house, the support staff in-house because they have to for compliance mm. and, you know, make sure they get paid and all that kind of thing. But if you're not one of the people that's bringing in the money or changing the reputation of the firm, it, you're kind of, you know, just an add-on. That's that's my experience of working for large legal companies. Um, I, th I think that... There's a there's some truth to that. Um, I mean, I I felt that the six years that I um, kind of did in my in my last firm. Um, I mean, I did some amazing. Like, I look back on it and I think, wow, I did some amazing things. Created quite a lot of change in a very tough environment to create change in. I think it's very easy in in certain environments in certain cultures to um, keep things. Uh, kind of keep a steady hand on the you know on the on the steering wheel the rudder whatever you want to call it and I think that's an environment that you could quite easily do that and that would be considered quite acceptable from a people perspective um but I mean I guess part of the reason why I'm an interim and why I set up on my own is that's not really my bag <laughs> you know I'm, I'm kind of you know one life to live just want to you know give it my best shot, do my best work. I'm not interested in just turning the handle. And and so that's the reason why I didn't want to work for a third, because I was like, it's taken me six years to build a strategy, develop certain things, put, bring in some, um, some things into this business. And I don't want to, you know, and I want to be doing, I want to be working with different people who, you know, and challenging myself as much as, um, doing good work. So that's kind of the reason why I didn't want, to work for a third and I also wanted more flexibility and and um and I you know I and unfortunately I don't have children so at that time that was kind of quite a tr quite a difficult position to be in but it was made dif more difficult by the complete lack of flexibility that there was within my co within that role and within that culture and um so I kind of thought whoa you know I could sit sit and wait for a baby maybe um, and try and get flexible working but even in that kind of culture it, it wasn't terribly flexible and so I just thought you know I'm kind of done somebody else can you know come up and enjoy this environment and feel like it's really for them but you know my place is kind of elsewhere so yeah so 16 wow. years later and I'm still kind of doing it 
Thank you so much for sharing that story. That uh, like, there's a lot of similarities with my own journey there, um, like mm. from your background to you know feeling like the the woman in the city and you're walking around outside the tube. Yeah, I'm going to London. I'm going to work in London. I'm from Manchester, so I'm like, yeah, look at me in London. Oh, um, and then you get rude awakening and you're like, oh, sexual harassment. Mm, lovely. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. I want to talk about confidence because. You you come across so confident. You've got poise. It's clear that you are so comfortable in your own skin and your own abilities. Just from having met you for you know ten minutes now, um, I want <laughs> to talk about your journey with confidence. So, can you walk us through that? You know, where did that confidence come from? How did you how did you build that up? Oh God! Well, thank you, thank you for for start. It's taken it has taken building up. Um, where does it come from? I think, um, I think upbringing. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, like I said, my parents um, were really supportive. I guess um, didn't really put pressure on me. So that whole university, or, or you know, I went to a, a like a new uni, old poly you know, which I never realised would be a disadvantage, actually, until I got, you know, because for me, it was like, whoa, I'm winning at life, you know, I get, <laughs> I get to go to do a degree and something I like. Um, and, um, and my parents didn't have any idea about the importance of which place you choose, because I, I, I did have a choice. They were just like, just get in there, just go for it. Um and so I think that kind of attitude helps, you know, not having it, it helps and it hinders. Like my parents didn't, um, they couldn't facilitate cer certain things that you need facilitating these days, probably. So networking and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, but what they could do was be supportive, um, not put too much pressure on me. Um kind of give me that feeling that I could do what I wanted in life, which I think is a very powerful thing to feel that you, you know, even if it's kind of not true, <laughs> you know, but, but there's an element of that, which I think gives you, um, you know, until you come across a door that's closed, you kind of don't really know it's there. Um, if that makes sense. Um, and, um, so I think that's probably important. Um, I love that. Sorry, also, Sharon. So you yeah. come across the door that's closed, you kind of don't know it's there. I actually, that profound. <laughs> I really like but, that. Because <laughs> I think, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like it's a yin and a yang, isn't it? You don't really, yeah, you don't really appreciate that you've got to push against it. I mean, it you know, I kind of look back on my life and I kind of think, wow, how privileged I am in lots of ways, but also how um, how hard you got to work for it. Um, in uh, So it's kind of, yeah, it's like one of these head shrinkers, really. I don't know. Um, but from a confidence point of view, I think part of it is um, I see... <laughs> I see it's kind of like life is a bit of a like um like a I'm a big fan of lifelong learning. Do you know what I mean? And I don't mean that from a academic perspective, you know, but just being curious, um not you know, kind of taking feedback, but also and and trying to learn from it. So when shitty things happen, I don't know if I'm allowed to say shitty things you can you can edit that out if it's wrong <laughs> but when bad things happen Maybe to you like... or when <laughs> <laughs> or when things happen to you like you know having a first job and I'm kind of getting into a situation where somebody who had a lot more power than me I kind of didn't even really understand why I was having meetings with this guy until it was like oh that's why we're having meetings. It was a kind of, and and also being much more observant about what was going on in the theme, in the dynamics between him and, and women within his circle of influence, for example. Now that kind of stuff was a bit like, whoa, I, you know, I have no idea what to do in this situation. Um, but 
you know, kind of not letting it, but, you know, kind of being okay with that. I don't know. Or seeking out support for that. I had a really great mentor on my first job. Otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get through that without her. Um, and and also this guy who was immensely you know, I count two people who were really central to my career at that stage because my manager really didn't give any support. So it was kind of like, so, so I think the confidence comes from not, you know, kind of accepting that, you know, these weird stuff and, and, and stuff happens to you. But like, what do you, what can you take away from that? Like, and how can you get, and also not feeling that you need to do it all on your own. I guess that's probably why my passion project, my side hustle is so important because, you know, if we, if we keep, you just don't get any sanity check if you're sitting there on your own thinking this is, this is only happening to me. It's only when you start talking to people and opening up and being a bit honest that you actually realise that there are other people in the same boat as you. And somehow, I mean, obviously, it's not going to help me, and you know, when you're ploughing through it on your own. But it does give you some, it does give some confidence, I think, and support that you feel like you, it's not just happening to you. Um, and there's comfort in that, I think. Um, so, so yeah, I just yeah, and now I just think i am quite you know i'm always going to be learning hopefully i'll learn until the day that i pop my little clogs um but um but i'm also quite happy that you know we're a work in progress but i'm okay i'm okay with who i am at the core and and um and i think that gives you confidence cat i think that's what i'd say knowing who you are and and being comfortable with that, but not being afraid to know that you, when you mess things up is gives for you confidence. Cause yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that. I would totally and utterly agree that it's that, you know, if you can look at who you are in the mirror at the end of the day and be like, I'm proud of you. You're pretty awesome. But also, you know, be open to it. Don't get a big head, but you're pretty awesome. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Yeah, I can't be big. I'm not, there's no no big heads in, in no big heads were allowed in our house. You know, it's kind of like you had to be, you know, it was okay to be okay with who you were and be and know who you were, but like a bit of humility, you know, that that was the way to go for us. Yeah. <laughs> there was a, a couple of things that you touched on there that uh, really resonated with me, and the first one was where you said. Um, you know, knowing that somebody else is going through the same thing that you are, it helps you to be able to cope with that thing. And it resonated with me for two reasons, because I know we spoke before we started to record about why we started this podcast. And that was one of the reasons to hear voices from other people that may be experiencing the same thing that you are. Um, and, and the other thing was that's why I um, started to offer group coaching. I was working with a charity and I was coaching individual um, leaders of colour that worked with them. Mm. And I found that in every session, they would each tell me a similar thing that they were experiencing in different parts of the organization. And this is a huge organization. Um, it's a national charity. And um, at that point, I thought what we really need is to get you all in a room so that you can all hear that you're all doing the same thing and hear how how one person has dealt with that thing and another mm. person. And that is why, you know, I really feel, and, and, you know, Kat knows that I'm launching a group mentoring program in March as well. And it's the same sort of kind of reason is let's get you all in the room because you're not on your own and the coping strategies for you will be the same for another. But what I did want to ask you following on from what you said and particularly your experiences and knowing that you said you had a mentor that helped you to get through those early like horrible experiences that you had in the workplace what would you say to another young woman or entry-level person that's going into a workplace because we know that these things do still happen they may not be mm. so overt um but we know that these things still do happen what would be your advice to somebody else that was experiencing something like that oh gosh um, 
I'd say the thing that I'd say is that, um, I mean, I felt like I was quite naive going into the workplace, really. Um, and um, I'd say the first thing that I would have told my younger self, really, if I think about it like that, would be don't blame yourself. Um, because I think we can um, think that we should have spotted the signs earlier for example, it, well, like when it comes to something like, um, you know, something that can be quite subtle, subtle and co coercive, not really very obvious. It's not the same, you know, I kind of used, to, I, I remember having like a really heated conversation um, with someone saying, you know, I don't think you understand. It's not the same as you go into a bar and someone like kind of grapes you or something you know that's not how it works in the workplace you know people you know things can be a lot more subtle than that so I would say don't um don't be too hard on yourself cut yourself some slack is what I would say to the to the person I'd say be like really aware of what's going on and be um and 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 be probably a little cautious I think when you first start work I think it's good to be to see the lay of the land you know kind of suss out what's going on um I think I'm I probably wished that I was a little bit less kind of jumping in kind of a person and a bit more cautious and um, with 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 kind of age comes um a little bit more wisdom and also if it doesn't feel right then it's probably not right I think your gut reaction on things um, is usually a good marker and so I think um, and, and then reach out to people you know it's important to find somebody that you trust and that, that will give you a listening ear and give you really good wise counsel which is you know what my mentors did for me um, you know, so I think, yeah, um, find find some good people who you can get a sounding board from. I think those are really important throughout your career, um, but particularly at the start, I think. It's brilliant that you had those mentors, you know, those people looking out for you at that point. But how did you – I'm interested in how you found them. Did they come to you or did you – Okay, so then did you know about mentoring or was it like a casual relationship that turned into like a mentoring mentee type relationship? Um, I guess they probably wouldn't necessarily have thought of themselves as mentors necessarily. You know, um, I, you know, when I started my work, um, I think I was their first grad, grad person that they'd ever had. So I kind of don't blame them for, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't blame them for not knowing what to do with me. I mean, it was just a bit <laughs> like, like, what are we going to do with this person, you know? Um, and, but there was a guy that started at the same time as me who, um, who I'm still in touch with now, actually a guy called Paul. And he, um, he was older than, he was older than me, but he was kind of starting back, restarting his career. He went, you know, he, um, after a few years, he'd, he'd done certain jobs and then he went and did his degree and then he came back again. So he was kind of like the older graduate, as it were. Um, and so he was a really good sounding board because he'd got previous work experience. And I'd only worked in a bar and as a, I think I'd, work, I'd worked in, a, in retail as a Saturday person, a bar and a, and a usher at a theatre. So not, you know, not masses of experience. Um, so he, Paul was really good at helping me. And so I used to, kind of, if I didn't know how to do certain stuff in an office environment, he was really good. And then, um, and the, and then there was a, a woman who was much more senior in the department who'd been there for quite a while, a lady called Hazel. And she was just amazing um, at the more, I guess, political you know, the kind of things in the office that nobody ever tells you about, the, you know, the dynamics, the, you know, like how to navigate stuff, you know, like when you come across somebody who's a bit like a more challenging and, you know, she was just, yeah. So I kind of, it was a little bit of, they, they sought me out and I sought them out kind of thing. Um, 
and like I said, you know, I look back and I do think of them as my kind of mentors. And although it wasn't the same as what you'd get nowadays, probably it'd be a lot more formalized. Um, sometimes you just have to make you have to make it um, you have to make it happen because it's not. I think that was the rude awakening, you know, kind of thing. You know, I come in and I'm all sunny and optimistic. And then it was a bit like, oh, this is really quite grown up. And I've got to kind of find, nobody's going to give this to me. And so I had to find it really. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You weren't your stripes. Um, I I do think like, into I've got an opinion about mentors where you know that sometimes that formal I have people come to me and they're super nervous and they're like um I don't know if you ever take on mentees but um, I'm up. and I'm like yeah just call me just put a meeting in whenever you need me let's not make it too like oh we have to meet every week or we have to meet every month or you know we don't have to have a contract and shake our hands and be like I'm not your official mentor just call me whenever and that's the way that I had it as well because when it's a formal mm. relationship sometimes you don't get to properly know the person you know you don't know whether you don't get to just hang out and have coffee you're always thinking this is my mentoring hour I've got to think of 10 questions that I need to ask them you know I think that sometimes Mm. the evolution of just you know falling into a mental mentee type dynamic is also great Mm. I'm glad you found that sorry Dawn you're going to until she gets about 23 mentees and then (laughs) and then she'll be (laughs) (laughs) I do. So, I've got a troop. I've got a troop of mentees. <laughs> you got a troop. <laughs> yeah. So um, HR. Now, obviously, you know that I'm from a HR background as well, and it has traditionally been a very female orientated space. Um, and maybe because of the kind of nurturing element that HR has for employees to some level, um, we kind of try to calm things down, basically. <laughs> um, but I am noticing more and more now that there, when we're getting to senior leadership, and I'm talking about directors, heads of, all of that type of thing, that there is quite a lot of men in that space. So not necessarily more than there are females, but definitely more men there than I would have seen equally at the lower levels working their way up. So something's happening there <laughs> where um, it looks as if men are able to skip the stages that we've all had to go through to get to kind of senior leadership in HR and are able to come in with, I don't know, a degree in economics and be <laughs> director of talent and acquisition or, or you know, something like that. So what are your thoughts on that? Is it just me <laughs> that thinks that um, there seems to be a disparity there? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I would say no. Um, I mean, I am... Um... So I didn't start in HR. Like I started in in um, I had a kind of a bit of a wiggly route into into the people space, um, but I always found it quite curious um, that it was like oh, you know, um, male boss, you know, loads of women in the team, not you know, and not many men coming in at like kind of a grassroots level and kind of working their way up. Um, which I know, I mean, it's kind of complex and stuff, but I used to go like, where are all of these kind of guys hiding themselves and then suddenly becoming, um, you know, um, directors and, and and CPOs and stuff, um, chief people officers and, and whatever. Um, and and I also, I, I often have um, a beef on Twitter or you know, particularly with panels, I'm just so tired of like going to, you know, in fact, I, I actually don't go anymore to sessions that just have all male panels. Cause I'm just like, sorry, but you're not trying hard enough to, to get a diverse range of voices. And, and, and it's not that, um, and, and tired of having conversations about, um, Oh, well, we asked some women, but they just didn't want to come. And you're like, mm, try harder, you know. So I'm kind of a bit like, um, I, I, 
you know, it's not, and I think it, coming back to what I said at the start, like I never used to really think about um, too much about representation and how important that is. Um, and in fact, I can remember kind of hearing the words come out of my mouth about, um, you know, kind of almost like um, not acknowledging, you know, the challenges that women have in certain spaces. And similarly, men, I'm sure, in, in certain spaces. Um, and I kind of feel that that does a disservice to, um, you know, kind of... Um, the barriers that are in front, you know, the doors that are closed, that the doors that you don't even see are closed. I remember going to a really powerful conference and um, I think it's Deborah Francis White who wrote The Guilty Feminist was talking and um, she was saying that, you know, you know, a lot of um, people don't acknowledge that the doors are, are even there let alone that the doors are open and that they're closed for some people. And and that kind of curiosity, I think, about um, about appreciating, um, you know, who who's sitting around the table and the makeup of that and why aren't we seeing more X or Y, you know, kind of representatives, a broader scope of, of things. I think I've become a lot more vocal about that as I've got older, I think because I think I probably belittled it when I was was younger. I didn't want to be – I don't think anybody wants um, special privileges, which is, which is, I think, where the conversation often very quickly goes on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. I think people just want, um, you know, equitable access, which is different – um, and they don't want to feel that they're being given a special pass or anything, but they do want to acknowledge that access into spaces or roles or whatever it isn't from an, from a like an equal starting point, you know. And that's quite a complex debate to have. Um, but anyway, that digress. But yes, you're definitely not alone, Dawn. I don't think <laughs> in in seeing I, and noticing that. that is um, just picking up on that as well, because I noticed what you said in the beginning when you said when you first went into the workplace, you didn't really want to, um, you didn't acknowledge the fact that you was a woman going into the workplace and it was just kind of, and I think, so I talk about that. Um, I'm rerunning my masterclass this evening, the Diverse Leaders and Founders Masterclass, quick plug, even though you're not going to see this too much. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I talk about on there is actually that that is part of the kind of mental constructs that we've had in this society. So whether it's a patriarchal society, whether it's the racism in society, whether it's the ableism in society, is that we don't want to be different. We don't want to acknowledge our difference. Mm -hmm. And I think what I say to people is actually, you need to harness your difference because that is what brings the perspectives that we need in the world to make the world go forward and that a lot of the time what we do is we do hide we do try to assimilate and be one of the boys we do try to do those things and we're not we're kind of taught that I think even growing up I know myself uh, being uh, as a from my um, my parents, my you know my grandmother, that type of thing. It's that sort of keep your head down, don't let mm. them notice that you're you know, and just kind of get on with it. And I think we're coming, um, we're in actually an era now where we're kind of like fuck it, <laughs> I am who I am. This is who I am. This is my difference, and you should not treat me any differently because mm. of it. And in fact, you should be glad that I'm bloody well here. Um, and I, I think that that's kind of the mind shift, or the mind mm. shift that I would like to encourage people to have as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you know, and I think also maybe one of the things. So you can't see because I'm sitting down. Um, but when I meet people, they're like, "Oh my god, you're so tall." Right. Um, and <laughs> and I think you coming back to Kat, when you were saying about confidence, I used to want to be smaller and shorter and like um, and not be seen because it's quite hard when you're, you know, a tall woman <laughs> to to not to not be noticed, you know, um, especially if you want to wear 
like different shoes and not flats all the time, you know. So I am. Um, so I think that um, sometimes it took me a while to kind of realize that even if I didn't want to be seen, it was quite hard, you know, not yeah. to be. <laughs> so I kind of just thought, you know, um, and I and I'm I'm kind of with you. I think there has been. There's an interesting dynamic, I think, between because I think you want to be treated as an individual, who you are, how you show up, appreciated for that. But there's also, you know, there's something about a collective power as well, which I think is is kind of so you getting the balance between that being treated as an individual and 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 not um, like a homogenous group. You know, we're all women, but we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. You know, it's that kind. And I think, and and all, and so sometimes I think it's a bit of a head shrinker to kind of keep those two things in your head head at the same time. Um, but I think that's where I hope progress in in society goes. You know, we're all individuals, but there's a collective strength in um, in in being together and acknowledging our similarities as well as our unique differences. And we can, and by bringing that to the workplace or to communities or society as a whole, and I think we can, you know, there's a real potential to kind of get, um, you know, the, the, the sum of the parts of, you know, that kind of greater, you know, together kind of thing going on, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a really important shift. I think that I see, um, and I think yeah. not, you know, I, yeah, and things, little things as well, like that are not protect, protected characteristics necessarily, but like accent, for example. When I moved south, um, people always used to comment on my the way that I spoke, and used to ask me to say certain words because you know and and stuff and um and I just kind of didn't I didn't really care even when I went into the city um that I didn't say the words in the same way as somebody else who I was sitting next to you know that there's partly because I guess I wanted to be slightly mischievous and by that stage I kind of also felt I'm actually quite comfortable who I am and this is where I, you know and where I come from um, which is a bit of a mixed bag anyway, but it gives me a, I kind of feel like it gives us a bit of a sense of individualism, sense of mystery. Um, and I'm fairly, I'm fairly ordinary really. So I quite like to feel like I'm a bit mysterious, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're not ordinary at all, Sharon. You've got 1800 <laughs> people in your network that you've kind of helped to c create and done a lot of the work for. So I wouldn't say you were ordinary. And I am five foot eight. So I understand a bit about what well, I don't know how tall you are, but I'm bridging on that that area where you know I hardly ever wear heels because I'm always then towering above everybody else. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I could definitely <laughs> concur with that. Sorry, Kat, I think I interrupted you before. Was you gonna? Oh my goodness, I, lo I love this tall woman vibes. I'm five foot eight inside, but sadly I stopped growing at age fifteen. I'm still really livid about it um i wanted to ask you about authentic, authentic leadership um because it's really hard to become an authentic leader especially when you've had to assimilate your whole life and you have to go through that moment of wait a minute who am i actually as a leader you know let's forget all of you know that was chris that was definitely paul that was Laurie, and I'm actually naming my uh, my actual bosses. But what is Kat as a leader? What am I, you know, what, what am I putting out there? And you kind of have to earn, unlearn all of this stuff. So I'm interested in that journey that you went on. You know, obviously, you have to go into organizations. You're by yourself. You're bringing about huge change, and you're doing people stuff. And people stuff can be really, you know, a hairy monster that comes out from under the bed sometimes. So what what was your journey to get to authentic leadership and you know in that what little nuggets would you pull out for women coming behind you to find their authenticity oh gosh um i think um god where to begin i think um so i would say i've made tons of mistakes um 
when I kind of think, I think part of the reason why, when I think back to like why I set up on my own, like why I kind of left um, kind of permanent employment and set up my, on my own, um, I've always loved my job. You know, like I've always loved what I do. I always, you know, and um, one of the things that um, I was worried about um, was that I might, there may come a point when I didn't love what I did anymore and I didn't want to get there. I didn't want to be that kind of person that doesn't believe in what they're doing nor um, loves what they do. Um, and I'm not saying I love my job every day, um, <laughs> but mo more times than not, I really believe in what I do and, and, and I love what I do. Um, so I think that there's something um, – um, and I think that the person that I was when I was in uh, my last permanent role didn't really start to feel like me. I felt quite um, constrained, I think, um, by the environment and the culture. Um, and um, so I think part of um, being authentic is opening up to your own mistakes and not thinking that you need to be perfect. As soon as I stopped thinking that there was some kind of like model leader model I don't know person the the pressure felt like it had been like lifted off my shoulders and I could just be myself and I could and and sometimes you make mistakes and if you see and I think there's a real authenticity about admitting when you've you know cocked up or or something could have been better or um or you think that was a good job or whatever, you know, this it's just about, I think there's something authentic about that. Um, I think believing that life's a learning journey and that you have a capacity to be curious and learning um, all the time, I think also opens up a lot of, again, it, you don't feel like you need to be the finished art. I, I don't feel like I'm the finished article. I still feel like I'm going to grow up one day. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and um, and that, I think, also helps. And I also remember going to this um, conference once. Um, actually, it was a law firm conference um, um, for, like, kind of leaders and in the people space um, in law firms. And this, um, this senior leader was saying that, you know, you might only meet that person for the for one time and the first time so what kind of impression or you know legacy as it were do you want to leave with that person and that also really helped because I kind of thought you know who do I want to show up as you know and I do it all the time and you know like whether I'm I don't know bumping into somebody or helping someone with directions on the tube because I kind of look vaguely friendly I guess and um then you kind of want them to have you know like this is who you are and that that also was very helpful to be authentic you know um so it doesn't you know occasionally I'm grouchy or cranky I often say but most of the time I, sh I just want to show up as who I am and that I think well, and sometimes, yeah, and I think if you don't put too much pressure on yourself, then I think that helps you to be authentic. Because you can always, you know, you, you, you kind of tweak things. You know, I, I say the wrong thing. The next time I see the person, I can say, oh, God, I felt like I really put my foot in it then. You know, I think that helps, personally. Yeah, so don't aim for perfection. That's what I say. Think about a work in progress and... That feels we are achievable. All definitely works in progress. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Sharon. We come to the end of the conversation and I feel like we could just be like chatting away for ages. <laughs> um, but um we've really I can speak on behalf of Kat when I say that we really loved having you on I think that you have um really given some nuggets that people who are coming up in the space either in the interim space or as a woman leader or pivoting from working permanently to setting up on their own and and being an authentic leader I think you've just kind of tucked 
all of those little buttons. So I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much on behalf of the Diverse Leaders Conversation podcast for coming in and speaking to us. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. See you soon.